Greetings, Chieftain here, Nick Moran. And this video is being released on or about St. Patrick's Day. So guess what? We're going to have an Irish topic of discussion. Now, first things first. There is, for some reason, a tendency in the U.S. to write Patty as P-A-T-T-Y. This is wrong. And it drives people in Ireland absolutely up the wall. You go to Dublin Airport with big signs. There's even a website, paddiesnotpatties.com. So I just want to get that out of the way. It's uh, Pat, Paddy, Patrick, but not Patty. Patty was a character out of uh, Snoopy cartoons. War Green, Peppermint name. Anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, so where are we coming from? Where am I coming from? Well, uh, last video, somebody complained that I kept showing the same photograph of myself, say, this is who I am. So just for that individual, here are a couple of different photographs. You may know that I currently drive a desk. That's one of the problems of being a field grade officer. Before I drove a desk, I drove Bradley's. And not too many people seem to know that, or commanded them, I guess. And before Bradley's, I was an Abrams tanker. Fantastic, but that is about as far back as most people know my background. Before I was an Abrams tanker, though, I was a Trooper Moran of the Irish Defence Forces on Forza Casunta Artul, which are the Irish Reserves. And there's a wonderful photograph there of myself in my finest number ones, uh, and another one of uh, just being off in your typical field exercise, great Irish dreary weather, the rain, uh, the cup of tea in the back of the truck, and for those that like to mock the American PT belt, note how we have applied it to the entire vehicle. And uh, they even left me with a couple of souvenirs. So this is the old cap I used to have. It's called a Glengarry, and it is unique to the cavalry trooper and the officer. And, uh, well, I'm not going to go on to the history behind it too much. Suffice to say, Irish Army cap badge. Now, why am I going into this, you may ask? Well, I'm going to do this presentation on armored vehicles of the Irish Army, but because it's not a very big army and uh, I'm trying to fill up a bit of time here, so I'm going to make the odd digression, if you'll uh, bear with me. So the cap badge, FF, Fianna Fáil, literally translates as the Soldiers of Destiny, although Foil also could mean Ireland because it was an old name for the island. Uh, around the outside of the cap badge says Ogli and Heron, Irish Volunteers or Soldiers of Ireland. The sunburst is an old Celtic uh, symbol, and the star has, according to the army, absolutely no meaning whatsoever, and was simply added to balance out the design. I held, as to say, the glorious rank of trooper. Now, all the ranks were according to branch. So if you're a cavalryman, you're a trooper. If you're an artilleryman, you're a gunner. If you're in the signal corps, you're a signalman, and so on and so forth. Actually, it was kind of fun. Uh, a little bit of esprit de corps. And my rank was three star, which looks awfully impressive. Uh, it means basically private first class. The unit I was in, the 11th Cavalry Squadron. And the irony of that is that I joined the US military and ended up in the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment. So I stick with 11th Cav both ways. Was stood up many moons ago as the 11th Cyclist Regiment, known to all and sundry as the Peddling Panzers. But uh, that's... Uh, the background to myself and where I'm coming from, why I have this strange accent that seems to confuse people on YouTube. So a little bit about Irish military history in general. I mean, Ireland is actually somewhat proud of the military heritage it has. It just doesn't advertise it very much. Even the national anthem, it's called the Soldier's Song. Uh, Irish history is, uh, shall we say, it's a long story of failed optimism. Many rebellions against the English, uh, most of which failed miserably, but eventually made it to a level of independence. Officially, Ireland is a non-aligned nation. Uh, not technically neutral, there is a difference. It kind of picks and chooses when it wishes to be neutral. Uh, but in World War II, uh, the country was basically neutral with a slight slant to the Allies. And I would recommend, uh, if you can find my Chieftain's Hatch article, Stinky and the Emergency, it gives you a wonderful background on all the shenanigans that were going on in Ireland, like keeping prisoners from both sides of the war in the same camp and then letting them out on day passes to go to the cinema or the races. It worked. What can I say? Uh, Irish people are also famous for going off and fighting in other people's wars. So they'll, they'll, I guess, they're just looking for a punch-up and they want to keep the home country nice and calm. But uh, you go to pretty much any war, the Spanish Civil War, American Civil War, World War II, we'll, we'll, we'll be fighting usually on both sides. Today, though, the Irish military is known primarily for its peacekeeping operations. It has a UN school in the Curve for peacekeeping, very well regarded. 
Uh, however, it has not always been free and easy going. Uh, there was a, something of a shock back in the 1960s when it was realized that the Irish tricolor and a statement of neutrality was not necessarily protection against everybody that didn't like him being in the country in the first place. But for the rest of this, I'm going to go over the background of the Irish military, focusing primarily on the armored vehicles that it used. Now, the start points, uh, the independence and the Civil War. So we're talking about the early 1920s now. On a very basic level, the Civil War is an argument over just how independent the country was going to be from England. They had one side said, look, this is good enough. And you had the other side, no, we want complete independence and freedom and the whole 32 counties thing. I'm not going to go into it. I'm probably going to get it wrong anyway from the purists. Instead, we're going to look at the armored vehicles. And some of the first armored vehicles the Irish had were Lancias. And there's an image here of the Lancias having pulled into position and then adding as protection for some 18-pounder guns against the Four Courts, which is the Irish version of the Supreme Court of the US, shall we say. Uh, the rebels uh, had taken over control of the Four Courts, as well as some other parts of the city, and the Free State, i.e. the government, were trying to get rid of them. Uh, the Irish Army was not a professional organization at this point. It had barely been stood up. Uh, it had a hand been downs from the British. Uh, the gunners didn't know how to use the 18-pounders. They simply fired over open sights. But they learned on the job. The Lancia armor car, 111 of them were transferred over from the British. Many of them were 1916-era Lancia 1Zs, and the rest were 1921-era Toyotas. Uh, some of them had cages added to the top to stop against grenades being lobbed in. They were known as cage cars. They carried a crew of three plus 10 dismounts in the back. A whopping 35 horsepower engine with a top speed of approximately 60 kilometers an hour. The thing weighed about 3.7 tons. Again, we have another shot here of the Lancers being used as cover. This is a different location for the 18 pounder. And note the graffiti on the side. Uh, one says, We have no time for truisers. And the other one on the front says, For goodness sake, shoot straight. The Irish Civil War was actually quite a vicious little event. It doesn't get very much notice, but. Uh, it was uh, noted for its violence and uh, extremes, shall we say. A number of the Lancias were modified for railway protection. and This basically turned them into self-propelled armored trains. Uh, you take the wheels off, replace them with railway wheels, and off you go. Irish rail gauge, by the way, is five foot three. So how that matches in directly with the Lancia, I'm not entirely sure, but a number, as I say, were changed over. Now, the other significant armored vehicle that the Irish had at the time was the Peerless armored car. And this is basically an armored body on top of an American TC4 Peerless truck. And uh, the armored body wasn't even long enough to cover the entire flatbed. Note the overhang uh, at the back, where uh, behind the rear axle, where the flatbed continued, but the armored body did not. Twin turrets with twin machine guns. Uh, it was a highly reliable vehicle, although at 7.5 ton, it was a little bit on the heavy side. A couple of them have been uh, retained in good running order. One of them is in Bobbington, and you'll see it there in British colors. The other one, AP1, uh, and the marking system is actually fairly simple. It was uh, Armour Car, Peerless 1, uh, is in its old slate gray in uh, the Curra Museum in Ireland. Could do 18 miles an hour in theory, but it was limited to 12. Now, although it was very reliable, it was roadbound. However, it was used in one of the first ever amphibious assaults uh, involving armor. And uh, this was an attempt, actually a successful attempt, by the government forces to go around the back of the rebel lines and simply take their centers of gravity, the cities mainly, from behind. The armored cars were basically craned onto ships in Dublin and whatever they could do to get off at the other end. So the photo here is with the Peerless coming off of Avonia in Cork. Now the problem is that the ship arrived at night and then they realized that they couldn't actually get the armored car off the ship easily. They ended up using a combination of ramps and cranes to get the thing off. It was considered so much of a hassle uh, that for future operations they moved to other uh, armored, lighter armored vehicles. So the actual first amphibious assault that I'm aware of with armored vehicles was actually in Mayo, uh, just before the Cork one. Uh, but that also required the use of a crane. The pride and joy of the collection in the Curra, and by the way, if anybody in the Curra is 
watching this and might want us to do an on-site view of the vehicles you have in the collection, please let us know. I'm sure we'll be happy to go over and do some footage. Uh, the Pride and Joy is the Rolls-Royce Armored Car, ARR2, known as Sleeve Le Mans. Uh, the Rolls-Royce Armored Car was, uh, firstly, an incredibly elegant vehicle. Uh, it's uh, the one in the UK, in Bobbington. It's David Fletcher's favorite vehicle in the entire museum, and it's very easy to see why. Highly successful, saw service worldwide, even saw service at the beginning of World War II. Thirteen of them were given to the Irish, and they were all given names. Sleeve them on uh, was uh, the armored car that was part of the escort to Michael Collins when he was killed, and that was the one that was retained. Originally, it had the English spelling of Sleeve them on. Uh, sometime in the 1960s or so, they changed it to the Irish. Uh, the rest of them were sold at auction in 1954. They hung around for quite a while. One of them, Tom Keogh, is restored and it's owned by a private collector in the UK. If you have a look on YouTube, uh, my English counterpart, Challenger, actually did a video piece on Sleep the Mom when it attended Tank Fest. And the soldiers there will give you a rundown on the vehicle, how it operates, the strange starting system and so on. It's not, it's not obviously what you would expect to find in a modern vehicle today. On this picture, again taken during the emergency, which is what Ireland called World War II, Note the Rolls-Royce armored car next to a bloke wearing what looks like a German helmet. It was a 1927 Vickers design. The Irish actually liked the idea of the German helmet with the uh, low rear, but the Germans were not allowed as part of the Versailles Treaty to build them. So they went to the British and said, Vickers, would you mind awfully, can you have some helmets of this German design? They weren't very successful, and frankly, they looked too German, especially once the emergency happened. And the Irish went on to uh, the more typical British uh, wide-brimmed helmet. The rifle the guy is carrying is a Lee Enfield number two. The vehicles were 55 to 60 miles an hour in service, very fast. They had an 80 horsepower engine, and they were very reliable, very quiet, known as whippets locally because of their quiet speed. Now, the first tank that they got was a Vickers Mark D. Uh, very closely related to the Vickers Mark C you may have seen uh, in the background to the Japanese tank tree because the Japanese bought the Mark C. Only one Mark D was built. The Irish took it. And it was basically derived from the medium Mark II, which you may be familiar with from the game, except they revised the layout. They've now put the engine at the back. They've improved the suspension, improved the mud chutes, and they used a six-pounder for high explosive purposes as opposed to the more high-velocity three-pounder that the British were using also had four Vickers machine guns. A 170 horsepower engine came in at almost 12 ton and would do 20 miles an hour. It was tested in the UK by Ireland's tank expert, Lieutenant Sean Collins Powell. He was the nephew of Michael Collins. He was trained at Aberdeen in the US in tank usage and was then sent to the UK to test out the vehicle before bringing it back to Ireland. The vehicle was out of service by 1937 and was scrapped three years later. Then we move on to the Landsverk L60. And one of the odd things about the Irish military is they seem to always name their equipment after the manufacturer, not after the model number. So you will know this as the Landsverk tank, not the L60. Two of them were required, number 601 and number L602. Landsverk 60, number one, number two. Now, these showed up in 1935 and 1936, and the idea was to have a little bit more capability for training in both tank and anti-tank operations. If you only have one tank, i.e. the Mark D, it's very difficult to do things like bounding overwatch uh, or how to deal with mass tank attacks. So by adding two more tanks, then I had three tanks and could do the appropriate multi-tank training. They would have a little towed trailer uh, that if they had to be transported around the country, uh, you'd run this thing up onto the tow trailer and tow it behind a truck, and that kept the wear and tear down both on the vehicle and on the roads. However, they were off the road by 1953 simply because they couldn't find spare parts for them anymore, and they were officially declared useless in 1968 because they ran out of ammunition for the Madsen 20mm uh, and the Madsen 303. 15 millimeters of armor, 30 miles an hour, seven and a half ton. It was actually a very good vehicle. I've uh, had the pleasure of clambering around one in Sweden, and it is surprisingly roomy inside, considering how small it is. They do both still survive. Uh, 601 is now in Collins Barracks Museum in Dublin. Uh, Collins Barracks, incidentally, was the longest occupied barracks in the world, from 1702 to about 
2003, give or take, uh, somewhere around there. Nearly 300 years. Uh, and L602 is a runner, so she is still part of the cavalry collection in the Kerr. And again, Kerr lads, if you are interested, we'll happy come and see you. So your next armored car, there's many armored cars in this list. The Leyland Terrier TE2. Early 1930s, the Peerlesses are getting on a little bit in age, and the solution was to take the body of the Peerless armored car and plonk it onto a modern 4 of 6 chassis. The result was unsatisfactory, so they tweaked it again. Uh, they removed the Peerless body and turret, and they replaced it with a turret from Landswerk, uh, mainly for commonality. Uh, the Landswerk tanks rather impressed the Irish, it seems, so uh, they stuck with Landswerk for quite a while. They were rebuilt again in 1957, re-engined with a Ford V8. Uh, they had the Madsen 20mm in the, in the Landsberg turret and would do 45 miles an hour at 155 horsepower. The closely related vehicle was the Landsberg L180, known as the Landsberg Armored Car. Eight of them were purchased. Uh, again, they liked Landsberg. They figured less had the commonality. They had the Landsberg turret. They had the 20mm cannon. Attempts to buy an additional five in the late 30s were cancelled due to embargoes against Landwerk. Landwerk was basically a shell for the Germans. Uh, since the Germans officially were not allowed to have their own armaments industry of that nature, uh, they basically went to Sweden and gave them lots of money and designs, and they did their development work there in effect. And so any attempt to purchase equipment from Landswerk was basically deemed to be aiding the German arms industry. It was not well regarded at the time. The original configuration, he had solid tires, 20 millimeter again to Madsen. Later on, by 1941, actually very quickly, they moved to pneumatic Dunlop tires. A Ford V8 again showed up in the 1950s, and the cannon was changed out for Hispanic suites at 20 millimeter in the 1970s. They got the 20 millimeter from the Vampire fighter jets that were going out of service. There's a lot of recycling uh, in the Irish system. Originally, the top speed was 50 miles an hour from the 160 horsepower engine. Later on, with the new tires, it went up to 60 miles an hour. In terms of general appearance, they were very similar to the Leylands, uh, but they had a higher rear for the rear-facing driver. So this is one of those earlier armored cars that had drivers going forwards and reverse to get yourself out of trouble about as quickly as you got into trouble in the first place. And this design philosophy kept on. You'll see it in the armored cars that Germany produced the heavy eight rads and some of the six rads in uh, World War II period. The French, after the war, kept it up. You'll see it on the Panard EBR, for example. And indeed, the Spepanzer Lux, up until out of service maybe 15 years ago, uh, also had the rear-facing driver. So it was an idea that never really went out of style. They went out of service, this 1939 vehicle, in 1982. And there are still a couple of survivors scattered around. All right, so now we're moving on to some of the more operational vehicles. This is the Ford Mark V or the Ford Mark VI. And you start off with a Fordson E88T truck. Very basic civilian truck. You add armor to it and a Vickers machine gun. Uh, or a Hotchkiss machine gun in the Mark V. It was done by Thompson in Carlo in 1940, and they were kept around in service for quite a while. Now this white one, ONUC, the United Nations mission in the Congo. Yes, these were sent to the Congo 20 years after they were built. Two of them were at the siege in Jadoville. So if you've seen the movie on Netflix recently, yay, the Irish get a movie, um, people will wonder how it was that a force of a hundred and something Irishmen held off several thousand opposition without taking a single KIA. And part of the reason uh, was that not shown in the movie were a couple of these armored cars. Now these things were ancient at this point. However, they were armored cars with Vickers machine guns. And if you're not doing very much maneuvering and if the opposition doesn't have any armor of its own, you have a very decided advantage. So these things were very, uh, very critical in the siege, and they didn't get any, uh, any attention, shall we say. Uh, they were very reliable, at least on the roads, uh, not so much off the roads. And they were gone uh, by the 1970s. Now, the Congo was that wake-up call that I mentioned earlier, that perhaps the Irish military needed to advance on in years from the World War II equipment and training that it had. When it went off, uh, they were equipped with thick wool uniforms and Lee-Enfield rifles. 
and again, to fill up a little bit of time, a little show and tell. One of the nice things about living in California is that you get to own a couple of toys that um, if you're a collector, I started collecting weapons of the Irish Army. So here we have the Lee Enfield. Now this is the number four Mark II of a type which would have shown up particularly for the Congo. A bolt action rifle with its origins before World War I. Don't get me wrong. The Lee Enfield is a fantastic rifle. For modern combat, not so much. So after the first couple of uh, battalions went to the Congo and got massacred, well, not the entire battalion, but the Niemba massacre is well known in Irish military history, they decided it was time to upgrade. And this is why you have in that image the rather incongruous appearance of a World War II, an early World War II homemade armored car, complete with lads walking around with FALs. The aforementioned FAL. Okay, technically because I live in California, this isn't legally an FAL and ignore the 10 round mag, but you get the general idea. The lads who used to serve with this back in the day are probably reminiscing now with the, uh, the old Energet site that they had. The, um, uh, it's been so long. There we go. Let's see your heavy grenade site. But the important thing about this, the right arm of the free world, as they called it, is that you now had a modern semi-automatic rifle with which to uh, defend yourselves. Highly regarded weapon in Irish service. It was brought back in uh, about 2011 as a designated marksman's rifle. And you can't say enough good things about this. So this became the Irish service weapon for the next 20 years, 25 years. And we'll move on a little bit later. That was the other reason that the Jadoville lads were able to survive so well, is they had improved from the 303s. There were still some in the service at the time, at that siege, but they also had FALs. Now, the Universal Carrier, the most produced armored vehicle in history. It is not surprising that this also became the most numerous armored vehicle in Irish history. There were over 200 of them on strength until the 1960s. In the background, more of the armored cars. They look very similar, they're not, but uh, there were some Dodge armored cars, again, based off of a Dodge truck. It's proving all but impossible to find photographs of these things, so use your own imagination. Something that looks a lot like that in an old Dodge armored car, good luck. All right, so there's a couple of clips from the archive, maybe the lads can find on YouTube, and, and disturbingly, there, there's a video out there, the FCA, a cast of thousands, it's an ancient show, and I actually recognize some of the lads from my old unit. I'm not that old. Am I? Anyway. The Churchill Mark VI. Okay, now we're getting into proper tanks. Four of them were leased from the British after World War II, in 1948 or so. They were purchased after five years, not leased because the British didn't want them back. They were, frankly, a little bit obsolete. Uh, the addition of the Churchill uh, gave a couple of problems to the Irish military. The first problem they had was how to get them around the country because they were big, heavy, slow things. So they purchased a Diamond T tank transporter. A Diamond T tank transporter. And there were a couple of problems uh, with recovery as well. So, for example, one of them broke down in the 1960s at the Glen of Armagh, which is the Army's firing range. It was so heavy that nobody could pull the tank back to, the, to get repaired. They couldn't fix it either. Uh, so what they did was they dismounted the gun. They brought the gun back to the barracks. And from then on, whenever they wanted to do some target practice, they didn't bother trying to drag a tank from A to B. They just brought the gun to the tank, fired off the target practice, and took the gun home again. Eventually, they gave up. They buried it in 1967. Uh, it was, wasn't worth keeping a guard, I guess. Uh, and it stayed buried until 2002 when they finally dug the thing out and then gave it as a gift to a museum up in Northern Ireland. Now, they were used in Irish doctrine for infantry support only for a couple of reasons. Firstly, there were only four of them, so you couldn't really do any great maneuvers. And the other problem, of course, it's a Churchill. It's inherently not very fast. Now, after a while, obviously, finding spare parts for these things became to be a bit of a problem. And the motors that were in it were never the best in the world anyway, so they decided to have a look at upgrading them. So, the Irish Air Force were getting rid of their sea fires. And somebody had the great idea of taking the Merlin engine out of the sea fire and sticking it into the Churchill. By all accounts, it actually worked, uh, but it was considered more reasonable just to stop um, 
use of the Churchill entirely, not least because they'd run out of ammo. So that idea, although it's an interesting idea, and uh, I'm not sure if a Merlin would really have worked compared to the uh, Meteor, uh, but it was cheap, it was available, and it was powerful, so why not? Uh, however, the Churchills went out of service shortly thereafter. The Beaverette, we got a couple of those things, and the original Beaverette came with a turret, as this one in the REF uh, colors has it, and it's basically a, a regular car that they stuck an armored body on and a couple of planks of wood. After the war, they were converted into scout cars. You take the top off, you take the roof off, and they were apparently re reasonably well regarded. 24 miles an hour, two and a half ton, uh, with 46 horsepower in the engine. Now we go back to tanks. Eight comets showed up, 1960 or so, but the Irish government couldn't afford any spare parts. Uh, and then the British got rid of their uh, comet inventory, and they also got rid of the spare parts when they got rid of the comet inventory. Uh, then they had the next problem, which was that they didn't have any high explosive rounds. Uh, they purchased 500 rounds of APCBC, and that was it. Uh, actually, the problem with the HE round wasn't that they didn't have any, but there was a problem with the fusing, and they were deemed too dangerous to use. So they were fairly popular vehicles, if a little bit impractical, given they only had armor-piercing rounds available to them, but they looked very impressive, and they were good for training. And there you can see all eight of them, the entire maneuver force uh, of the Irish Army on parade. Now, one of them had a turret fire fairly early on in its service life. And then when the tanks ran out of ammo entirely to shoot with, there was a proposal to turn them into tank destroyers. And they put the 90mm PV-1110 recoilless rifle where the turret used to be. Never went anywhere, and I'm not entirely sure how fantastic an idea it was, uh, but it was an idea, and I'm sure model makers worldwide are salivating at the prospect of using this rather interesting conversion with all the interior details they have to do. The Great White Lady was the SKPF Model 42. This is a Swedish vehicle known as uh, the Coffin by Sweden. A number of them were transferred over. SKP literally translates as armored Scania truck. They came with twin water-cooled 8mm machine guns. They were reasonably reliable, reasonably well regarded, and one is now in the Cavalry Corps collection in the Curra. Twelve ferrets showed up in the Congo to replace the Fords, the old World War II things, which were really getting old in age. And uh, again, they were fairly successful, but they didn't have a huge service life. Also short-lived from the Congo is the M113. Six of them showed up from I'm not sure where, and they were returned after the operation was completed. Finding photographs of these things is proving all but impossible. This is the only one I could find easily enough. And again, you can see the Ford Mark 6s hiding there in the background. That was Ireland's only tracked armored personnel carrier. Moving on to slightly more modern post-war equipment, the AMLs. French armored cars built by Panard. The first eight showed up in 1964 after, again, the experience in the Congo. These were AML 60-7CS. CS was the cloche spécial, and it was the type of mortar that the vehicle was equipped with. And for an idea of scale, uh, there is a photo of my good self standing next to one of these things. I, my career in AMLs was very brutally short. The career progression is driver, gunner, commander. On day one of my driver's training, I got into it and realized that I couldn't actually operate the vehicle. My foot was hard down on the pedal, my knee was against the armor plate, and I was really generally uncomfortable. The sergeant takes one look at me and says, you're not a driver, get out. That was as far as I went with that, and then moved on to dismount rolls. Sixteen of these CSs were eventually purchased, followed by another sixteen with the Hotchkiss Brandt mortar, which you see on the other photograph. The Hotchkiss Brandt uh, had the interesting idea you could either fire it like a regular mortar by hanging around down the top, or it could be fired in a direct fire roll using a breech loading mechanism. The machine guns were twin 762s, so you could fire the one, you could fire the other. It, you, it was actually pretty handy if you didn't want the machine gun to overheat, uh, or if you had a stoppage on one machine gun. Also bought was the AML 90. And this was a 90 millimeter low pressure gun. The uh, South Africans may know it as the Eland 90. It's slightly elongated hull, so I might actually be able to drive that one. But otherwise, it's a very, very similar vehicle. Again, sent off in service around the world in UN service. 
Over time, the vehicle from the 1960s began to get a little bit long in the tooth, so upgrades were sought. Uh, the CS was taken out of service in the 1970s, and it was replaced by a caliber 50 because there was a problem with the mortar. It was a small design flaw, it was deemed dangerous, and a number of accidents said, okay, let's get rid of it. The caliber 50 is probably an improvement anyway. Uh, so that, what happened to the CSs? Then, later on, there was an idea, we've got to get rid of the 60 entirely, it's getting a bit old. A couple of ideas were proposed. One was a huge turret with the 25mm Bushmaster cannon. I can't imagine how much room would have been inside it, complete with the ca uh, cannon and the ammo feed. And the other was you take the Sabre's turret off of the Fox armoured car, and you plonk that onto the AML. The solution in the end was to go to South Africa and fit a 20mm G12 cannon. Uh, now, these are actually not South African turrets. The turrets of the 60s were sent to South Africa and uh, fitted down there, also with a better fire control system. The 90 millimeters got night vision, they got a laser range finder, they got fairly significantly well upgraded. Uh, finally removed from service in 2013. Now, I'm going to digress a little bit to wake you up on a little side story. Um, we had the occasional charity event. We'll go down to the main shopping street in Dublin, it's called Grafton Street, where we'd be collecting for a charity which, at, if I recall at the time, was a children's hospital. So you may see firefighters do this in the U.S., for example, but would be there, would have the armored car for attention, would be there with a bucket uh, asking for donations. A French tourist passed by. He recognized the Panhard armored car as being a very old piece of armored equipment, and uh, he apparently thought that we were collecting for money to buy a better armored car. Oops. However, 2013, they were finally gone. Now, in 1972, they decided to get a few APCs again. Uh, remember, the Universals were long gone. They went with the Panhard M3 VTT, a vehicle that transported the troop. Who knew? This was basically 95% commonality with the AMLs already in service. So that made uh, work very easy on the vehicle. Uh, 60 of them were purchased in 1972. They carried, somehow, 10 passengers and two crew. Uh, they had twin 7.62 millimeter machine guns in a well-regarded turret up top. They came with a 90 horsepower engine, the same 90 horsepower engine that the AMLs had. Um, so not very powerful, but it was short and maneuverable in the narrow Irish roads. So it was actually reasonably well-regarded, even though it looked absolutely archaic. Fourteen of them were upgraded with a, a new engine. Where can we get a new engine, they asked themselves, to fit an armored personnel carrier? Well, look no further than the Peugeot 605 passenger car. As it comes with 140 horsepower diesel, good enough. They put that in. Uh, 14 of them uh, hang around until the early 2000s. The rest of them were gone by 1996. Now, the Landsverk Unimog. What are the most hideous armored vehicles you will ever see? They were bought bargain price. They were originally going to go to the Congo uh, Gendarmerie, and after the crisis, uh, they were held by Sweden. They decided not to send them overseas. And uh, the Swedish had absolutely no use for a large armored vehicle that carried four dismounts with the crew of two. Not knowing what else to do with them, they put them on the open market for a bargain price. The Irish snapped them up. Now that said, given that they were based on a Unimog, they had excellent off-road capability. Unfortunately, they were also very high center of gravity and they kept falling over. So they were very quickly put into reserve service. They only lasted four years uh, in the active military. And uh, by 1978, they were on in reserve units. And this was the hand-me-down policy. And basically, generally speaking, if anything was no longer good enough for the frontline troops, they were given to the reservists. And they had a very long service life there. Uh, they were gone from the reserves by 1984. Now, Ireland's great success story in terms of vehicle production is Timoney. Uh, they made armored cars uh, back in the day, and today they're well known for their suspension technology. A lot of vehicles around the world use uh, Timoney suspension, such as the Australian Bushmaster, the, uh, the Terex that Singapore uses, uh, even some of the trucks that are in service with the uh, American military are uh, Irish suspension. For the Irish Army, they built five Mark IVs and five Mark VI's. 
And if these look a little bit familiar to you, uh, look at the Belgians. They built the BDX, which is an internal security vehicle. It's basically a Timoney armor car built with Belgian specifications and painted blue. Uh, they're still in service in South America. The Mark IV, uh, correction. The Mark IV showed up with uh, twin 762s. The Mark VI showed up with a caliber 50. Uh, the initial petrol engine ones uh, were okay regarded. They do 90 kilometers an hour, but it was the Mark VI with the Detroit diesel engine uh, which was better regarded. Comes in at 11 tons though, uh, but was used in the armored car squadrons. Now, one of the other problems you had with the uh, armored personnel carriers was that you're getting in and out of these things uh, with very long rifles. Come 1989, a new rifle enters service. It's a Steyr Aug. And to give an idea of the comparison in size, how easy it is to get in and out of these things, we bring back the FAL, and we bring forth what is pretending to be a Steyr Aug. Again, California, ignore the minor detail differences. You can see the difference in length. Imagine trying to get in and out of an armored vehicle with this great big monstrosity. The AUG was much easier. We are back to tanks, or at least, well, are pretended to be tanks. The FV-101 Scorpion Combat Vehicle Reconnaissance Tract. Fourteen of them were in service. Originally, they had a caliber 50 mounted on a very large pintle on the turret roof. They were finally removed and replaced with a 762. Uh, they have been modernized over the years. Uh, they showed up 1980 to 85. They are still in service today. At least the ones that can keep running. There are arguments over how many of them are still going. Back to armored personnel carriers, the Sisu. Uh, Ten of them were delivered in 1989 by the United Nations. After four years, they decided to add a turret taken off of the old Panhard M3s. Again, using what you got to make things last a little bit longer. Generally well regarded, uh, but eventually removed from service, replaced by newer and better pieces of equipment. The current standard is the MOAG, known to the rest of the world as the Piranha 3H. And Americans may see a striking resemblance to the Stryker uh, interim combat vehicle. It's an 8x8, built by the Swiss. Uh, most of them are armored personnel carriers that came with an unstabilized caliber 50 in a turret. 18 of them were converted into cavalry reconnaissance vehicles by use of the remote weapon station with either a caliber 50 machine gun or a Mark 19 40 millimeter. And these weapon stations are exactly the same as you may be familiar with from US service. They also had medium reconnaissance vehicles which have a 30 millimeter cannon in a turret, as you would imagine. Good firepower, for, especially for the weight class of the vehicle. They are now starting a modernization program. The old 50 cal PCs are being upgraded to remote weapon stations of their own. The latest addition to the Irish inventory, at least in terms of armored vehicles, is the LTAV. It's basically an RG32M. Uh, and it is a mine protected vehicle. Again, it can come equipped with a remote weapon station. And these are seeing service in far flung lands, especially where there is a risk of landmines. So, Shin I Shin, as I say, literally translate as that is that, is a story of basically every armored vehicle that the Irish ever used. You will note that Angry Connor is not one of them. Uh, exactly why the lads at Blitz decided to take up an archer and Paint that Irish, I'm not entirely sure for Paddy's Day last year. Maybe it's coming back this year, we'll see. Uh, but that is your general story of Irish vehicles for St. Paddy's Day. I hope you found that at least somewhat interesting. Nice long list of vehicles, and we'll see you at the next one. So, you may how did I get into this? Well, a friend of mine basically talked me into it. Thanks, Dennis. And uh, he seemed to be having a good old time. I uh, decided to look into it for myself. Now, one of the differences is that there's no recruiters, as you might find in the US. And they just put an advert in the Irish Times for the regular army and say, hey, we've got 40 position. Who wants it? And thousands of people apply. So they pick and choose. Uh, the Reserves, being a less well-regarded organization, and bless them, they, they do their best, but it's, it's not the National Guard. Um, there seems to be a bit of a challenge. Like step one in the weeding out process is figuring out who to talk to. So like anybody else, 
I go to the yellow pages. And I go around, start looking around, army, 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 see defense forces. Go see the defense forces. Eventually, I get a number for defense forces headquarters, public affairs. So I give them a ring. Defense forces headquarters, Captain Blank speaking. I say, hey, um, how are we interested in joining the FCA? How, how do I do about that? I say, well, where are you? I say, well, I'm down south Dublin, Konski area. I say, well, can you get to Colborough Barracks in Rath Mines? Yeah. Great, what would you like to do? I hadn't really thought about that, actually, that, that far. And I kind of go, mm. well, how about a medic? Do you want to be a medic? And I get, maybe they had blank spots in the medical corps that particular day. And I kind of go, that wasn't really what I had in mind when I was thinking about it, honestly. It was more like delusions of Rambo. And I kind of hem and ha. I said, well, do you want to save people or shoot them? I said, shoot, please. I said, all right, turn up, show up uh, Thursday evening for the 20th Infantry Battalion. And uh, that's how I ended up going in. I ended up deciding to go cavalry instead. But um, I, th I think that gives you a rough idea as to, as to the lark. <laughs> that was the FCA back in the day. Uh, things have improved since, I'm told.